are you amped up about this man i think i, I know i am because i'm almost you know like losing train of thought <laughs> Now, before we move on to the scene with Andromache, um, where Hecuba and Andromache um, talk over what has happened, I just wanted to have the spotlight for a second on the chorus. So, in this scene, um, the chorus have a, a longer speech after Hecuba's um, lamentation where she wishes, um, perhaps, that she was dead. Okay, so the chorus ask for the gods to sing them songs with tears and howls and and what they do here is they also go over the story of the trojan horse okay so this was hinted at in poseidon's earlier speech but now there is uh, a more detailed explanation of the tragedy that occurred when the greeks used the trojan horse to get into troy and to sack it so this speech is really about um you know the deception that happened that occurred on the part of the greeks and there is a real feeling that women and children are being uh, brutally treated within this particular section so so think about this as as me giving um the the audience a real insight into the reality of war and the reality of of the war games and methods that they use okay so imagine you're a greek man in the audience listening to this you know for example that these things happen you know that the wars are happening all around you but this perhaps this excerpt from the chorus well i certainly hoped would give them an idea of what the real impact of that behavior and um you know the, those government decisions what impact that had on the real people so so think about the chorus here and, and how their sharing is encouraged to to garner some sympathy from the crowd enjoy the scene oh where are hecuba's women your venerable queen has fainted she's collapsed and lies speechless on the ground don't just let her lie there, you bitches. An old woman fallen flat on her face. Get her up on her feet. No, no, leave me alone. Your kindness, my girls, is no kindness to me. Let me lie here just as I fell. What I am suffering and have suffered, what I will suffer yet is more than enough to make anyone fall and never get up again. Oh, you gods, what good are you to us? Betray us! And yet, people still call upon gods when bad luck or history has flattened them and the whole of their world has collapsed. So, let me tell you how fortunate I was. Born lucky to heighten the tragedy of what has happened to me now. I was royal by birth, and I married a king. My sons excelled, not merely because I bore so many, but because they were the best among the Phrygians. What's more, they were Trojans, and such Trojans as no Greek woman or barbarian could ever boast of bearing. And I saw every one of them slaughtered by the swords and spears of the Greeks. By their open graves I have stood and cut my hair in mourning to cast upon their bodies. And so many bitter tears I have wept for their father Prim. No one told me of his death, no one brought me the news. With my own eyes I saw him hacked down on the altar steps of our holiest temple, and the whole city sacked as the Greeks ran riot. All the daughters I brought up with such care, to make them fit brides for princes, I saw them snatched from my arms, their good breeding wasted 
on brutal soldiery and foreigners. There's no hope they'll ever see me again, or that I will ever see them. And now, like the keystone to my arch of misery, in my old age, I must go to Greece to finish my life as a slave. And what work will they give me, a woman of my years, to be a gatekeeper, looking after the keys? Me, the mother of Hector, or a kitchen skivvy kneading the bread dough? I won't sleep on a royal mattress any more. The floor will be good enough for my bony back and wasted flesh. Worn out, second-hand dresses will do for me, rags even, the sort that well-bred women never see, let alone wear. They will have to make do for my worn-out, second-hand body. Dear gods, what a terrible retribution, all that has happened to me and will happen, because of that one woman and her love affair. Cassandra, my child, what violation will end your consecrated virginity? That mystic ecstasy you share with Dionysus and all the gods, and you, my poor girl, Polyxena, where are you now? None of my children, neither sons nor daughters, and there were so many of them, can give me so much as a helping hand in my misery. They are all gone. So why try to help me up? What for? What have I to look forward to? Well, take my hand and lead me step by step, these feet of mine, so used to deep carpets, all the luxury of Troy, they belong to a slave now. Bring me to my bed, my straw palliasi, stone pillow, Throw me down there on my face, and let these tears, my torturers, whip me senseless. Well, good fortune, it's all worth nothing. There is no happiness. The lucky ones are dead. Teach me, gods of song, some harsh lament, dissonant with tears and howls. Help me to sing Troy's sorrows, invent new sounds for my grief. The Greek horse on wheels has ruined me, brought me to the edge of the grave, made me a slave. Unguarded they left it by the main gate, its god she pierces gleaming, and from its belly the clash of armor plate rumbled like thunder, muffled and threatening. So we ran to the rock of the citadel, the whole population shouting, Come out, everybody, all our troubles are over. Wheel this wooden offering for Zeus's daughter, Athene of Troy, inside the wall. And who ran from their houses faster, the young men or the old? All high on the singing and the joy, as they laid their hands on the monster, that was more than it seemed, and would doom them all to die. Then it seemed like the whole nation of the Phrygians ran to the gates, eager to bring that smooth plain icon of mountain pine and the Greek ambush within it as an offering to the virgin who drives the immortal forces of heaven for the Trojans' destruction. Roped with cables of twisted flax that heaved it, like a black ship to the stone shrine at the heart of the temple complex of Pallas Athene. Altars soon to drip, and smooth floors run slippery with Trojan blood. Then the melodious African pipe honeyed the air as the dark hood of night enfolded Troy. In celebration after the day's exhaustion, the whole city was singing, dancing feet stamping in exhilaration, to the rhythm of young girls' voices, flickering torches casting puddles of light in the darkened palaces and on the faces sleeping, 
and in eyes awake and glittering in the pitch dark night. At that time in our great hall with the others, I was singing all of our favorite songs to Artemis Zeus's daughter, virgin of the mountains, and joining in the dancing when suddenly I heard a terrible howl. The unmistakable sound of murder, a terrified scream. Rising from the streets of the whole city, children grabbed hold of their mother's skirts. Their pale hands plucked at her gown, fluttering with fear. The god of war had sprung his trap. The ambush strategy worked perfectly, thanks to Pallas Athene, whose power secretly inspired it. The Trojans were cut down in their homes, in sanctuary, beheaded where they lay, sleeping whole generation of women raped in their own bedrooms, breeding bastards for the Greeks, desolation for Troy. Look, Hecuba, they're bringing Andromache in a Greek baggage wagon. Her bosom is heaving with sobs as she grasps Hector's son, Astyanax, clinging to her breasts as they rise and fall like a bank of oars in the sea. Oh, I'm in pieces, it's tearing me up, but I know A heart that's broke is a heart that's been loved So I'll sing hallelujah And so Andromache enters the, the scene just as the chorus are finishing their lament And she comes in, as you can see from my stage directions uh, With Astyanax, her, her young son, who is wheeled in with her on top of a baggage wagon loaded with spoils. So, so think about the, the symbolic meaning of that, you know. The, the child himself is on, um, you know, a trolley full of um, treasures from Troy. So it's almost like he himself is a plundered possession from Troy. And that is certainly how he is treated later. Okay. Um, I like to think that Andromache has a little bit of vavavoom about her. Um, and, you know, when Hecuba starts to cry as she enters, Andromache states that uh, Hecuba should not be singing her victory song. So she's got that sense of irony there that, um, you know, uh, she calls it a victory song when really she's crying. So she's a very smart lady, is Andromache. Um, but obviously she is she's pitifully pitifully sad she she dearly loved Hector and now he is dead and, and uh, you know things aren't looking very good for her now the way that uh, I've constructed this scene initially is for there to be stichomythia which is a type of speech where um, people in the conversation are talking very quickly so so they're talking very quickly to each other and there's a bit of back and forth there all right. Um, so whereas some of the other speeches are much longer verses where one character is talking, doing their monodies, um, here we have the Stichomythia to show that Hecuba and Andromache are, are very similar in this. Okay, They've both been great women. They've both lost their great husbands. And they are both dealing with the fallouts to their, their children. Okay, so I hope you can see the contrast here between Andromache and uh, Cassandra because of the way that I've actually created the language to, to demonstrate their differences. Okay, um, there is a lot of emotive um, symbolism here, again, to show how terrible these women have it. Um, and then a little bit later in the scene, uh, obviously, Talthibius returns, and so when Talthibius returns, something terrible is about to happen to Astyanax. So, so think about how this plays out, but think about the strength of Andromache. You know, she is, uh, although she is devastated, she represents in many ways the most perfect of wives. She is somebody to be respected. She is somebody to be valued. And by portraying her thus, I am hoping, obviously, to point out to the men in the audience that, you know, this could be their wife, potentially. You know, if they continue the way that they're continuing, you know, this, this woman, Andromache, is a woman whose value is, is so high 
because she is so moderate and she is the perfect woman and she is being treated awfully. So perhaps that could just shed a little bit of a, you know, a light on the idea that uh, you know, by, by representing her thus as the perfect woman, I wanted the men to think twice about what they were doing because it could all turn very nasty. This could be happening potentially to their wives in the future. Hopefully, that might make them think twice about the sorts of wars they're engaging in. Enjoy the show. Son, the son of Achilles will hang up Troy's plundered splendour as a trophy under some Thiphian roof. My Greek masters are only taking what's theirs. Why? Why? Don't sing my victory song. Agony. The agonies are all mine. Oh, Zeus. Hard learned to be suffered so long. My children. No longer. Grown old in tears. All our happiness. Troy. Our city. Gone. Into misery. Oh, my children. My heroic sons. All gone. All gone. What grief is like mine. My suffering. The sobbing. The moans. Of our city. Ruined. Smoke blackened stone. My husband, where are you? I need you now. Save You're me. You're calling for a dead man. My firstborn son is in Hades, and I am in misery. Protect me now, as you've always done. O oh, my Priam, who the Greeks barbarously killed. Old man, great king, princely father, your sons were famous throughout the world. Let me sleep in the arms of death. Forever. So bitter these longings. Sharp pains now and sorrows unceasing. For the city we have lost. And miseries ever increasing. The gods always hated us. Their malice spared your son, so that his contemptible marriage should bring ruin to the citadel of Troy. Now, in bloody pieces, he's lying for the vultures in Palace Temple. Our slavery is his doing. Troy. Mother of us all. Tears blind me. Deserted. A ruin. This pitiful end. A house my children were born in. I've lost my home. I've lost my children. Everything. No grief can encompass what I feel. No funeral song. Flow tears for a city and family shattered past hoping. Only the dead shed no tears. They are beyond weeping. Suffering people find some comfort in tears. To give voice to grief is a kind of pleasure. O oh, Hecuba, mother of the son who speared, so many of these Greeks, do you see what they are doing? I see what the gods are doing, making monuments of worthless men and demolishing the good. We are loot, my son and I, soldiers plunder, Born royal and made slaves, the world's overturned. Necessity is logical and merciless. Cassandra has just been torn from my arms by force. No, no more. I can't bear it. So some second Ajax flatters his masculinity by dragging off your daughter. But there's worse pain to come. Of course there is. There's no end to pain. The next horror will be worse than the last. She's dead. Your daughter, Polycena. Murdered at Achilles' tomb as a sacrifice to the dead. And it is. So that's what Telthibius meant. The truth, his diplomatic evasion concealed. I saw it with my own eyes. I got down from the cart, cut down the body, covered it with her dress. Oh, my poor child. Ritually murdered. Filthy. Sacrilege. Oh, my poor girl. Butchered like an animal. Anyway, she's dead. However it happened. And she's happier dead than I am living. No. No one is happier dead. The living at least have hope. To be dead is to be nothing. Dear mother, listen. You are my mother too, even though you didn't give me birth. 
Listen and draw some comfort from what I'm saying. To be dead is the same as never to have been born. But to die is better than a life of agony, because the dead feel nothing, and no pain can touch them any more. Whereas someone whose life has been prosperous and lucky, and is then overwhelmed by disasters, knows what it's like to have been happy, and is heartbroken to be excluded from that paradise. For your child, it's as though she had never seen the light of day. She's dead and knows nothing of her sufferings now. It's different for me. Being Hector's wife, I aimed at the highest a woman could wish for, and I hit the mark. And now I have lost everything. Living with Hector, I made it my business to be the perfect wife. Never wanted even to leave his house, because that's the certain way to compromise a woman's reputation. Gave up all desire to go anywhere, and was joyfully fulfilled at home. And even at home, I admitted no fashionable gossip or women's chatter, but used my intelligence to improve my own mind, and was content with that. I lived quietly with my husband. My happiness was obvious whenever our eyes met. I knew what things were my prerogative, and how to give in gracefully to his authority in matters that were his. But my reputation as the ideal wife reached the Greek camp, and that ruined me. As soon as I was captured, Achilles' son asked for me as his wife, meaning his whore, to be a slave in the very house of the man who murdered my husband. If I drive the memory of my beloved Hector out of my mind, and open the doors of my heart to the man who owns me now, I shall betray the love of the dead man and mine to him. And if I refuse to allow this prince to touch me, I'll provoke the hatred of the man whose power is total over me and mine. They say one night in bed with a man will convince any woman and pleasure away her hatred. I spit in the face of any woman who forgets her dead husband to jump into bed with the next one. Dear God, not even a mare, uncoupled from her old yoke fellow and stable mate, will pull in harness willingly. And animals are supposed to be inferior to men, with no power to reason or speak their thoughts. But you, Hector, my love, you had everything I dreamed of in a husband. In intelligence, good family, wealth and courage, the greatest of men. You took me as a virgin from my father's house, and I gave my body for the first time to you in our marriage bed. Now you are dead, and I am to be transported across the sea to Greece as a prisoner, to be yoked as a slave. And Polycina, whom you groan and weep for, isn't her suffering far less than mine? You say everyone living has hope. What hope have I? I'm not stupid enough to delude myself with false expectations, pleasant though such comforting daydreams might be. Your suffering is like mine. Your anguish words give voice to my deepest agonies and fears. Oh, I've never been on board ship in my life, but I've seen pictures of them and heard men talking. So I know that if a storm is not too violent and there's some chance of survival, the sailors will do everything they can to come through it, hanging on to the tiller, scrambling aloft to the sails and bailing out the water for dear life. But if the waves run higher and towering rollers overwhelm them, they accept the inevitable and give themselves to the sea. And so do I too. The gods have drowned me in an ocean of misery. After so many sorrows and in such despair, words mean nothing. There is nothing left to say. But you, dear daughter, dry your eyes. No more grieving for Hector now. You must forget him. Even your tears cannot help him now. My advice to you is to make much of your new master. Be pleasant. Make yourself attractive to him. That way you will make everyone's captivity easier to bear and your own life more pleasant. With luck you may bring up 
this grandson of mine to be the saviour of Troy. Sons of yours may return to the ruins of Ilium one day and build a new city from the ashes. But look, the next chapter is already beginning. The Greek minion is coming back to tell us, no doubt, what the Greek council has finally decided to do with us all. Hector's wife, widow of the greatest of the Trojans. Oh, I ask you not to hate me. With the greatest reluctance, I must tell you the news. The joint decision of the council of the Greeks and the two sons of Pelops. What is it? That sounds like a prelude to disaster. This child, well, they have decided, oh, I, I don't know how to say it. No, don't take him away. We have different masters. Mm. No Greek will ever be his master. How is he to be the last of the Trojans left here? Oh, there is no decent way to say an indecent thing. Thank you for your decency, but no more bad news. They need to kill him. That's the worst. Now you know. Oh my God, that sentence is worse than my marriage. Odysseus' speech carried the old council. I, I, I can't bear it, I can't. That the son of such a father must not be allowed to grow up. May those arguments condemn his own son. And that he should be thrown from the battlements of Troy. This has to be. So please be sensible. Don't hang on to him like that, but bear this pain like the queen you are. There's nothing you can do. You are quite without any power to prevent it. So don't imagine otherwise. No one can help you. The city is in ruins. Your husband dead. You are quite alone. And believe me, we are capable of dealing with a single woman if we have to. So don't make a fight of it, or kick, or struggle, or curse the Greeks. If you say anything to anger the army, your child may not be properly buried, and no tears be shed at his grave. But if you keep quiet, and resign yourself to what must happen, they might allow you to bury your child decently and treat you with more consideration. My darling, my precious, too dangerous to live. Your enemies will kill you and leave your mother in misery. Your father's courage that saved so many is a death sentence for you. Everything that made him great for you proves fatal. Oh, God, when I came into Hector's palace on that unlucky wedding day and that unluckier wedding night, I thought I would conceive a son to rule over the whole of Asia, not a victim to be callously murdered, butchered by the Greeks. My dear little boy, are you crying too? Do you understand what's happening? Why else do you hang on to my hand like that? and bury your timid face in the folds of my dress like a bird creeping under his mother's wing. There is no Hector rising from the grave, with his spear in hand coming to save you, nor any of your father's brothers, no army of Trojans. You must jump from that terrifying height, all, and break your neck, smash the breath in your mouth without pity from anyone. My sweet baby, so tender in my arms, Dearer than all the world to your mother, the softness of your breath, the baby smell of your skin. All for nothing. My labour pains when you were born, all for nothing, when I gave you my breast and dressed you so tenderly in your baby clothes. All nothing. All for nothing. Hold me tight now. Hang on to me for the last time. I gave you birth. Put your arms round my shoulders and hang on to me, hard, and kiss me, my boy. You Greeks! You have dreamed up such cruelties even the barbarians would flinch at. Why are you killing this child? What has he done in his innocence? He's guilty of nothing. Helen, you daughter of Tyndarus, 
You are not Zeus's daughter. More fathers than one you had, and I know their names too. Destruction, first of all, and envy, and murder, and death, and every evil thing that crawls on the face of the earth. Zeus could never have fathered you to bring ruin and slaughter on Greeks and barbarians alike by thousands. Die in agony and be damned forever. You and your beautiful eyes, whose inviting looks have brought this famous country of Phrygia to complete destruction. Come on, then. Take him. Carry him away. Throw him down from the walls, if that's what your generals have decided, and then make a banquet of his dead body. The gods are destroying us all. I can't save my own child from death. Parcel up my disgraced body and throw it on board ship. It's a fine wedding I'm sailing to with my poor son left dead at my back. Poor Troy. Ten thousand men are dead for one woman and her hated marriage bed. Come on, boy. You must break that embrace now in spite of your mother's agony, and climb the walls to the highest bluff that crowns ancestral Troy. At that place, according to the vote of the army committee, you must give up your life. Take him then. Someone tough and unthinking they need for this job, without pity and no scruples. Oh, I am not. Oh, poor child, son of my dead son, to tear you like that from your mother and from me is wicked. How can I suffer this and learn to bear it? What can be done to help you now, enduring this? We can only beat our breasts in anguish, tear our hair, and that's all we can do. Our city is gone, and soon... You will be gone too. There is no agony we don't already feel. No abyss of pain to discover. What have I become? My sweetest friend. Everyone I know goes away in the and you could have